fa Michael Jackson sono notevoli, quindi eh, conseguenze a livello economico, di immagine, eh, che cosa è successo a Michael Jackson? What subito about, dopo il processo. What about the consequences on the <coughs> private and public life of Michael Jackson uh, financially and artistically after the process? You could see you could see in Michael's face at the beginning of the process he jumped on top of his limousine and was waving at all his fans and he was happy he he knew this was ridiculous. These were ridiculous charges. He was very sober. He was depressed. He had to listen to five months of continual garbage, lies, false statements, fabrication. He was, he was very, and he lost weight. He looked like, in the beginning he weighed 100 pounds, at the end he was maybe 90 pounds. Tutte le conseguenze del processo erano visibili direttamente sulla figura di Michael Jackson, che ha iniziato il processo uh, in forma uscendo dalla limousine e salutando i fan, convinto che insomma, il processo si sarebbe risolto in breve, essendo tutti i capi d'accusa falsi. Dopo cinque mesi di processo in cui era costretto a sentire testimonianze false e a vedere capi d'accusa manipolati, falsificati, aveva perso energia, aveva perso entusiasmo e, e anche aveva perso peso, era diventato molto più magro. Quindi tutte le conseguenze erano visibili direttamente sulla persona di Michael Jackson. And let me say one more thing. E vorrei aggiungere un'altra cosa. Uh, Michael fired John Branca in late 2002 or 2003. Che alla fine del 2002-2003 Michael Jackson aveva licenziato John Branca, il suo avvocato, personalmente. Everybody knows this. E tutti lo sapevano. Then, in August of 2003, Michael signed a $200 million loan with Bank of America. E ad agosto del 2003 Michael Jackson aveva stipulato un mutuo con la Bank of America per 200 milioni di dollari. This loan required every three months he must pay in cash to Bank of America quarterly payments. E questo mutuo prevedeva un, una rata che Michael Jackson doveva pagare in contanti ogni tre mesi. Now look at the timeline. August 2003, September, October, well, November. Thank you very much. I hope you people have enjoyed that. That was yours truly, William Wagner, uh, through a translator in Rome, Italy, for a program that I did on the Michael Jackson trial in Rome, Italy. Why did I go to Rome, Italy? Because I went all over Europe telling people who wanted to know the details of the crimes of Snedden, Auchincloss, Magna Cola, and that assistant who should be in prison, in my opinion, Ron Zonin for committing at least three felonies against Michael Jackson. And what you just saw was exactly what aired, minus the On Second Thought logo you see right here. Didn't have the logo, but that's what it aired in, I believe, all of Italy, at least Rome. So Italians, for the first time, and this is significant, for the first time, They got details about the crimes committed against Michael Jackson. All over Europe that I traveled in, and that was 10 nations, every person I spoke to, I asked, what did television or the newspaper or radio tell you about the Michael Jackson 2005 trial? And every single one of the people, and I, I met hundreds of people, Every single one said, we are nothing. All we knew was that he had been indicted in 2003, November. We heard that. Then all of Michael Jackson's music was banned worldwide, or at least in the countries that I was in. They couldn't get Michael Jackson music on the radio or TV or anywhere in Germany, France, England. It was not played. Anything Michael Jackson was not played. Then at the end, what they heard, oh, he's acquitted. And no details in between. 
Now, this is very disturbing to me. And I only learned this in my European trip last year between September and mid-November of 2012. And that interview you just saw was actually not done live on television. It was taped October 22nd. But what I learned is that though the proceedings and Michael and his attorneys, Susan Yu and Tom Ezra walking in, walking out, and all the hubbub and things that were said about the trial was being beamed up to a satellite. And there was for a while an Italian film crew here, but they left and I, one of the people in the crew said, this is all crap. We're going back to Italy. There's nothing here. And that was, I think, in the second, third, or fourth week of the trial. The Italians weren't going to waste their money on this uh, ridiculous fabricated evidence and faked evidence against Michael. But what it said to me, even though we have instantaneous communications worldwide, and this trial in 05 was being beamed up via New England television and satellite link that came all the way out from New England, and from them it went to all the networks and it went up to a satellite dish. Not a second of it appeared on German, French, Spanish, Hungarian, Slovakian, English, Holland, Belgium, and none of those countries. I forget all the countries I was in. <laughs> Sorry. Austria, yeah. I don't want to forget Austria. Uh, you know, I was in 10 countries. Every person said they saw nothing. They did not even recognize my photo, big 8 by 10 I would show them, of Thomas Mesereau. Unless they had come here to Santa Maria, California, to the trial, they didn't even recognize Tom Mesereau with his long white flowing hair. And that was very disturbing to me. Very disturbing. Who has the power to shut off any details of the trial to all these European nations when it was easily available from satellite link? Think about it. Not your federal government, not your state of California government, not ABC, CBS, Fox News, or any of them. Why did they have no knowledge of it? So there I was, and you just saw it, the way it appears on Rome television. And the Italians uh, now know a lot of details about the trial that they knew nothing about before. And that's why I was an interesting subject for an interview. Journalists do not generally go on other people's shows as a guest. <laughs> it just generally is not done. But this case against Michael Jackson was so exceptionally rotten. Rotten like Krabby Appleton. He used to be a cartoon character and he used to say, rotten is Krabby Appleton, rotten to the bone. That's what, in my opinion, Snedden, Zonin, Auchincloss, and that other guy that screwed up the fingerprint evidence or not the fingerprint, the um, telephone communication conspiracy evidence, Magnicola. He, as well, for his part, should be in prison. He should have been indicted. And, you know, it's not like I never said this. This is a photocopy of the Santa Barbara News Press. The front page, August 4, 15th, 2012. Because the day before, on the 14th, I appeared along with this large group of people here and we all, we all testified that felonies have been committed against Michael Jackson, the guy over here, the most famous person, probably one of the wealthiest celebrities and undoubtedly the one that had given the most charity money to children's hospitals and children's orphanages. $350 million worth of giving? That almost qualifies him for a saint by himself. Did the Rothschilds ever give that much? Did the Rockefellers ever give that much? I'm not talking about giving to your own foundation before tax dollars, you know, before paying taxes on it and then giving it 
out of the foundation. I'm talking about giving it out of his own pocket after paying taxes on it. That was Michael Jackson. That was the guy, these four rotten to the core prosecutors who I say and I affirm in my affidavit presented August 14th should be in prison. So that's why I went to Europe and I ended up on television in Italy, uh, made the newspapers in several other countries. And it's important. And people care about the truth over in Europe in a way they don't seem to care here. And that's, that's mystifying. Anyway, I want to wish you all a happy new year. We're in 2013. This is the first show of 2013. And a little later, we'll have some information coming up from my favorite Lompokian, Dan Petrie. But before we go to that, yesterday, there was a last minute, two minutes to midnight type hearing in federal courthouse in the Eastern District in front of Judge Morrison England Jr. And the issue was, the issue was, if President-elect Obama is using a fake Social Security number that was never issued to him, it was issued to someone in Connecticut, and if he does not have a valid selective service number, which he cannot produce, there is no evidence any selective service number was ever issued to him, and if the birth certificate, Obama, had some needlehead put on the official White House website, but didn't close the, the, the uh, didn't flatten the system in which they doctored the birth certificate, then he should be held for perjury and felonies and all kinds of crimes. He can't be put in office. And so a temporary restraining order was asked for by that intrepid fact checker, Orly Tates. And Orly Tates brought two witnesses, one a former military officer and one a typograph, a guy that does the hot lead print typing, 57 years. Before we went to computers, they used to have to set the type in lines and lines and lines. And then they got more mechanized and more automized, but they didn't have computers, they had typewriters. And it makes a difference. When Obama's birth certificate was typed up, they didn't have computers. And this guy, with 57 years, Judge England, who's a black judge, would not let him testify at a temporary restraining order to stop Obama from being inaugurated today. This was yesterday, 